wow, this is actually truth. It's not just information, it's revelation. And I'm very grateful to the Lord, oh Lord, that he's allowed me to partake in his truth. Um, it's exciting because, you know, there's so many people out there that are walking in darkness. They don't see the light. And yet he's handpicked us, he's chosen us for this time. It really is a privilege, amen? So I just wanted to say that. So we've been talking about um, eternal life and what the life of God looks like. Last week we looked at the benefits. Minister Daniel um, went over those with us. I'll just quickly go over them because we're going to talk about something different this evening. Amen. But basically what he was saying last night is qualifies and quantifies your life. That's what eternal life does. Um, it sustains you. Um, it beautifies you, it prolongs your life, it makes your life better, it gives you rest, it gives you joy, it gives you peace, it gives you health, and it gives you prosperity, and so much more. So the question is, why wouldn't anybody want that life? <laughs> like, why wouldn't you want it, right? It's been freely given to us, but yet so many children of God are not walking out this life. And the Bible says, in all you're getting, get understanding. So we really have to dig in and find out why. Because it's a promise has been given to us, but yet people are struggling in different areas, and we don't know why. So tonight, we're going to dig in and get some understanding. Amen? So I just pray in the name of Jesus that your hearts are open, your minds are open to receive the word of truth, that it will go in on good ground and it will bear fruits in your life. Your mind will be transformed. Your heart will be renewed. And you'll be able to live out the life, the eternal life, the promised life that God has given to us. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. So the first thing we're going to start off with is sin. What sin does to a person's life. Now, we've talked a lot about self. You know, self gets in the way of many, many things, but tonight we're going to focus a little bit more on sin, okay? So, sin brings a curse on the land. And we're going to start off in Leviticus 26, 19 to 22. I think I used the NIV, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I know I didn't use, I don't think I used King James, but anyway. Um, let's all read together. Is everybody there at Leviticus 26, 19 to 22? When we're all there, say amen. Amen. Okay. So it starts off by saying, I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven like iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your hand shall not yield its produce nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me I will also bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. Amen. I mean, that's a pretty serious promise. If you really break it down. I got stuck at the first verse, though. The very first verse just stuck me. I kept going over and over. And I'm like, I will break the pride of your power. The pride of your power. And what does that really say? It says in human beings, we actually think we're something. <laughs> like, we think we're something. We think we have power to overcome this. We think we have power to create great businesses. We think we have power. Just do so many things. We have gifts. We have talents. We can do this. We can do that. But God says, I will break that. Like, I'm just going to break it. The pride of your power. 
which also means in everything we're doing, there's pride. When we're doing it from our own volition, off our own strength, it's about us. And that really, really, it really, really got me because I was thinking of all, which we're going to get into, all the areas that we actually sin that I think we don't really know we're sinning. Because if we don't really know and study the truth of God's word, then how are we going to know? We're just all raised in a family with beliefs and things like that. I mean, we know the big ones, like don't fornicate, don't commit adultery. Everyone can usually, you know, battle those off, right? But there's many more that we are not aware of, right? And that's why, I mean, I believe God put teachers and counselors and prophets and that because they have studied. They've also gone ahead of us. They probably made a lot of mistakes, to be honest. Like, you learn a lot by failure, right? You do. Okay? And so they're able to come back and counsel. Like, believe it or not, I have 32 couples. They're marriage counseling. Hello. <laughs> like, it doesn't really make sense. But God uses your failure even for his glory. Amen? So this scripture alone, like if you just sit there and you can, I mean, right now we're, you look at it, you're talking about wild beasts and stuff like that. Okay, we can't really picture that wild beast. But if you look at it in your life, there can be wild beasts. There can be things attacking your finances, attacking your homes. It's just the language that they've used. But it says... After I break your power, it says, I'm going to make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. I remember Papa teaching this about, oh gosh, it must have been 15 years ago. I really did not fully understand it, to be honest. But basically what that means is poverty. Try to build a business, it doesn't work. Try to start something, it doesn't work. You know, you're trying to increase, it's not working. And you know the funny thing I've noticed, like, I was listening to someone the other day, I can't remember what it was, I think it was, yeah, it was a minister that I listened to, and she was talking about this prostitute, and she was saying, you know, there's this prostitute, and she comes into church all the time, and she pays her tithes, right? She's doing a good thing by paying her tithe, but she's also doing something else that's contrary to paying her tithe, but yet trying to tap into the promises, and yet still not fully into the promise and I think a lot of us do that right we get a few things right and we're like trailblazers with it but yet we have these other areas that just go unattended to and then we don't see that we're not reaching our potential or what God's plan is for our life and oftentimes I think we can become complacent and be like oh I'm okay I have a good income I'm doing okay you know, um, my children are fine. I've got a good house. I have this and that. But are you on your assignment, though? Like, unbelievers can do that. Right? So this is why I, I as I was studying this, I'm like, this is, so, why, this is so important. We have to know the enemies that are working against us. We have to know the obstacles that are in our way. A lot of times we come in praying, 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 and we don't even realize it's something small that we're not doing. Amen? Amen. So then it talks about, you know, I'll bring, I mean, this is God talking, right? Realize they said, I'll bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. That one's a little bit scary. I was thinking of all the people that are in the hospital. You know, some people just have all these sicknesses and they can't get healed. I'm like, Jesus, is that because of your sin? Is that because of someone else's sin? Like, Deuteronomy 29, 29, that's always my scripture. I don't understand. The secret things belong to the Lord. So I don't know for sure. But when I hear stuff like this, it gets your mind wondering, right? Like, why is this person going through all this? They're not necessarily a bad person. But when you read the scriptures, he says, so I care, look, he said, he said, um, uh, this part here, he goes, I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children destroy your livestock and make you few in number like th that's a generation that's a lineage and you can see some lineages there's been a lot of interruptions some people are left they don't have any children their children are dying before them like did this happen generations ago well yeah it probably did and it's going down the lineage 
It's like, you know, when you go into the doctor and the first thing they said, okay, we're going to do your medical history. Anybody have cancer? Anybody have high blood pressure? Like they start going through this, right? There's a reason they do that because they know those things travel down the line. So do sin that we don't pay attention to. Amen? So we're going to talk about how this impacts the beauty of people. And this, Papa was teaching about this Sunday. We've gone back there again. Because honestly, I had a real serious revelation from Lamentations 5, 7, 16. So let's go there. When everyone's there, just say amen. Amen? Okay. I usually write down what version I'm using, but so if it's a little bit different from yours, you know, it's just a different version. Okay, it says, our fathers have sinned, and are not, and we have borne their iniquities, which goes back to what I just said. Some people are living, am I in the right place? You guys are looking weird looks. Yeah? Okay. All right. I was just wanting to share. Pardon? Lamentations 5, 7 to 16. Is, I'm sorry, you guys got it? Okay. So our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Okay? So this is also an example of sin. Now look what happened. Servants have ruled over us. People who are not supposed to be over us, whether it be in a workplace, whether it be, you know, in families. I mean, I can't really think of a lot of examples right now, but you know what I mean. There's people serving, there's people over you that are not supposed to be over you because we've been called to dominion and authority. There is none that has delivered us out of their hand. We got our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness, hardship. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Oh, that's what got me. I was like, oh my gosh. This label, like this label, which many people do, they take something out of something and then they make it a doctrine. And I was thinking, I will never call a black person black again. Never. I just won't. Like when you were doing the thing, like white was considered to be holy, and I'm like, no, that's not true, right? But yet people have adopted it. Adopted it. Now we have a whole entire movement sweeping the globe because people are trying to gain back some kind of empowerment that's been taken from them. Like, can you just take one line and make it a whole entire movement? Yes, people do that. And that's what sin does. It works to destroy people. It works to destroy cultures. But it's a lie. So all he was doing was saying, our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Poverty, sickness. So now we've labeled a whole entire people under oppression, and they've suffered oppression. Like, how do we know that that just wasn't spoken over them? from how long ago, and they adopted it. They took it on, and that's what I'm saying. We take on sin like it's our friend. We live with it. We become used to it. And then we try to fight back. It doesn't make sense. Get rid of it. Jesus already took it, so no fellowship with light and darkness. So women have been violated in Zion still today. Women are still being violated up until today. Even worse now. If you really study human trafficking, your minds will just, they'll blow at what's happening across the world. We don't really, we're, we're kind of like, we're out of its, you know, arena. We have a safe space where we don't see it. But if you start looking, you will see what people are actually going through all over this world because of sin. And virgins of the town of Judah. Princes have been hung up by their hands. Princes have been hung up by their hands. Well, we're royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people, so. Elders are shown no respect. And we live in that time right now. Both in the body of Christ and just in general. 
Children don't respect their parents. They don't respect their grandparents. The status of being an elder, whether it be in the church or in a family, there's so much dishonor. And I mean, I remember growing up, I never, no one taught me about honor. My grandma was my friend. She shared cigarettes with me. Like, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, I didn't know. No one taught me. You know, we were all, my dad used to bring me around all his friends, and I was like part of the, the five years old. He would encourage me to talk. So there was no boundary. I, like, I, didn't, I wasn't taught those kind of things. And that, te- that was 40-something years ago, but look at it now. You see our generation now? The children now? You can't even talk to them. But this is sin. It's going to continue. Because, like, to be honest, Angel's testimony, I told Mama, they blessed me so much on Sunday. I was like, I can't explain it, but it just kind of opened my eyes to so many things. And I'm like, I want that. I never wanted it before until Sunday. I was like, hold on. No, I really didn't. Like, to me, if anyone knows me, this is not something I go to sleep and just want to be in the limelight or to be here or there. It's not something I want. I just want to help people. I want souls to be saved. I love counseling. That's what I love. So I don't really think, like I was explaining to Mama, like I don't really think, but then as I got off the phone with her, she really ministered to me. I was like, hold on. What sinful ideas and thoughts are holding me back from my assignment or our assignment? It's not really what we want. Is what did God choose us and call us to do? So just to finish this off, you know, young men toil at the milestones. Boys stagger under loads of woods. Let us just talk about that for a minute. Our young people right now, especially our males, they're all over the map. Yeah, hijacked everywhere, whether it be marijuana, alcohol, sex. It doesn't matter. It's they're just Satan is using every single angle that he can take out young males. Why? Because we need them. It's the same, you know, friends of mine are in a church. This is their doctrine. Women can't preach the gospel. They can't come on the altar. They can't lead worship. Great church, nice people. They're out winning souls, yes. But do you know if you think about it, that's knocking off half of the globe. <laughs> Let's take out all females. They can't win souls for Christ. That's not, no, it's okay. You can do it in a parking lot, but you can't preach from the altar. Absolutely. It's also oppression. It's demonic. It's not true. It's sin. It's a lie. The elders have gone from the city gate. Young men have stopped their music. The young men have stopped their music. I mean, that one we could overlook, but no, music is worship. What brings the anointing? It allows God's presence to flow and touch people, deliver people, save people. You know, ministers, every minister I've met, they need music. They need that to bring the anointing on. I, you know, joy is gone from our hearts and our dancing has turned to mourning. Sadness, depression, anxiety, it's taking over the globe. And the last part is, The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. All of this is still because of sin. We have to hate it. (sighs) Jesus came to deliver us from the penalty of sin. But as I was thinking about that, I was like, do we even know when we're sinning? Do we even know? Like I said earlier when I started, some of them are obvious. Some of them are not, though. And why? Because God does not look at things the way we look at things. And I listened to a podcast the other day, and it really got me, because I always know worrying is a sin, but I never thought reasoning was. Reasoning. But she made a very good point. Because when you believe things that you think are right, your reasoning will always back it up. And that's why I think Jesus was always trying to interrupt their thoughts. He was trying to stop them there. 
Before this gets into your heart, before this becomes a belief in a stronghold, let me just stop you there and say, what are you thinking about? Like, does this really line up to me and what I represent? I mean, he, his disciples were hungry. If you th see the things Jesus did, he did a lot of things that we probably, if we had a rule in the house, you know, everybody do this. And then we saw Christ come in. He's like, you know what? Let's just scatter. <laughs> Let's just all go everywhere do this. And we'd be like, no, it's not the rule of the house. You can't do that. But he decides on this day, we're going to do that. When he was the alabaster box, another one, you would think, you know what? We have to take care of the poor. We have to. They don't have any food. They're dying. He's like, right? You always have the poor among you. It's okay. It's about me. Prepare me for my, <laughs> prepare me for my death. I mean, it sounds funny, but it really is about him and what he thinks is important. And this teaching, and as I was reading the scriptures, is really ministering to me because I'm like, I don't really think like that all the time. I don't really think, but I really want to try to start to be more conscious and intentional. Like, are these, because the word God gave me before I even got saved, I told you, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. That was the word he gave me before I gave my life to Christ. He was preparing me, Lori, I know you reason all the time. I know you're smart. I know you're quick on your feet, but guess what? It's probably most of the time not going to line up to me. So I just want to plant that seed now. It took 22 years to germinate, but... I'm going to plant it now because I know my seed's going to grow. Some people are slow learners. We know that. Okay, I'm just saying. But it makes sense. He keeps bringing me back to that word. I'm like, oh, yeah. But, yeah, reasoning. It, it, we always are trying to figure things out, especially when it doesn't make sense to us. If it doesn't make sense, we find all kinds of things to justify our reasoning. Even with the children. Adults, I mean, listen, do as I say, not as I do. Children should be seen and not heard. Where did that come from? Like, really, where did that doctrine come from? But he's like, move over, let them come. I want to see them. I want to talk to them. Bring them over. That's Jesus. That's our Lord. The woman with the issue of blood, 12 years. How many times do we look at people, you know, homeless, or whatever, you know? My scripture is, you never know when you're entertaining angels unaware. That's a scripture, I don't know when it got in me, but it came as a revelation. So now I feel convicted if I don't, if someone's standing there, they don't have any money. The other day I didn't have any money, only a bank card. Everyone has pretty much a bank card now, so probably for you, Mama, who carries your change purse. But, you know, she says to me, she's standing there, and I could clearly see she was strung out on crystal math, right? But that's not for me to judge. And I didn't have any money, so I gave her my phone number and the back of her card. I'm like, you know what? We have a great benevolence. Come, call me. I'll come get you. I'll bring you to church. Amen. Now, this scripture, I know you've, we've heard it a lot that I'm going to say, but I really want to, these two scriptures right now really bless me. Ecclesiastics 2.26. Because I think this is really key for people to might understand. I'm not saying it's the reason. But we do got to think about it. Because there is some people who are getting blessed beyond measure. And we're all standing back like, how did you just build um, a church of five million and you didn't borrow a cent? Like, how are you getting that, Andrew? Just saying. Um, <laughs> like... How are you getting these things, you know? How, how are these people getting these things? Because the same promises that are available to them are available to us. It's not like he's a respecter of persons. Although, I think he, let's read this. It says, to the person who pleases him. Pleases him. So, I do think there is a little bit of, like, favoritism. I do. I think we have to admit that. Right. Yeah. 
No, I do, I do believe that. There is. Because, but it doesn't mean that, the, that we can't be in that favoritism pool. Okay? Because we can. It says, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless. A chasing of the wind. Now, how many times have we read this scripture? So the wealth is going to be transferred from the unrighteous to the righteous. We stick on that. We have our minds. You know what? You guys are gathering. Get it. But we often overlook the prerequisite. Why do you think he wants to give it to someone who pleases him? Because if we please him, he knows we're going to use it for what he wants us to use it for. Right? We're not trying to gather things because we need it. We're gathering things for his kingdom, for what he wants us to do. And I think that's probably one of the, I know it's definitely a stronghold I'm dealing with. I think it's probably one of the biggest ones most believers deal with, to be honest. Yeah, every believer, thank you, is letting go of what you have because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I think for me, the quicker you get honest with yourself, the better you can get on the path of being able to please him. Because in order to get wealth, we need wisdom, right? In order to get all those things, we need to get what we actually, it's like we're, ch- we're chasing what we want, but we're doing it with the wrong tools. And he's like, listen, I, I can make you a trillionaire if, you, if that's it. Just please me. These are pro- like Job 26, 11, 36, 11. Days in prosperity and years in pleasure, amen. Acts 3.26, the New Living Translation version I like. And it says, when God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to you people of Israel to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. This is why we need the life of Christ. Because we can't do it without him. We're going to see in a minute, like, we need faith. But we cannot do it without him. It's impossible. Even though we try, but you can't. So how does eternal life reign unto immortality? So Romans 8.29, Pastor David was, you know, ministering that on the altar earlier. We have been called to bear the image of Christ. We know the scripture. We do know it. For God, you know, Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. We bore the earthly, but God is moving us to take on the heavenly. So we already accomplished the first one when we were born. (laughs) We're here. And he knew before we were coming here. I mean, that alone is pretty humbling. Like, you chose me out of where? I have, a, I have a friend of mine, and she, you know, she was telling me a story one day, and I thought it was pretty amazing, but she said she remembers something, and she doesn't know why she remembers it. I go, what do you remember? She said, I remember being in, like, it felt like space, and there was many other bubbles with a me. But she, I said, well, what did you look like? She goes, I don't know. I don't feel like I was substance. I just, it was a great light. And she's in, it just felt warm and loving. And I'm just like, but when she was telling her story, it was with such conviction. And I'm like, it could probably be true. Because I went to that scripture. I'm like, you knew us. How did you know us? Well, we don't know. What did we look like? Were people? Were we just a thought? Like what we were? But the point is, he said he knew us. And I believe him. I believe that he picked all of us. Because how could we just know or believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and died on the cross? Why don't the other million and two believe that? Why do we believe it? Why do we believe it when we're in our prime and we're being called to do something? Somehow we have that knowledge and that truth somewhere in us. So when we hear it, we know it, we gravitate to it, we know it's true. 
I remember telling my friends about it. They thought it was an occult. They thought it was, you know, why? Well, maybe they have it in them, but they didn't have it for that time. So we are called. And 1 Corinthians 15, 49 is basically saying the same thing, but it says, just as we have borne the image of an earthly man, this is NAV, so we shall bear the image of a heavenly man. And it doesn't say that after we die. It's basically talking about now. This is how we're supposed to look now. So how do we get there? Because we hear it all the time. I've heard this since I got saved. I remember Jewel thinking we were arrogant and prideful, remember, when we were talking about Glory we, series. yeah, right? <laughs> and left the church. Like, it's not like we have not been ministering this truth for a long time, but yet we're kind of coming back again to the foundation, coming back again. God's like, okay, you know, it's our, truth has always been here, but we have to embrace it. How do we do that? In order to operate the eternal life Paul lived, it's by faith. Galatians 2.20. My old self, the earthly man, has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, NLT. Amen. And Paul, I believe, was a great example for us to look at. He still struggled. He says that. Things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. I mean, he went through that earthly back and forth struggle, but he was determined because he had revelation. He knew who he was. Like, I might be going through this, but I'm not supposed to. I mean, we have to get there. We have to know this is, this. okay, if this is sin, what is it? We got to deal with it. We have to figure it out and get rid of it. We can't just become friends and live with it, become complacent. Because we're moving into this heavenly state that we're supposed to be living in. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to require, what, what does it say? Faith without works is dead. It's going to require work. Christianity is not complacency. Which goes to point two, it's a fight and it's a war to lay hold on this eternal life. First Timothy 6, 12, which I put the NLT again because I like it. It says, fight the good fight for the true faith, for the true faith. Not the coming in church, holding up holy hands, coming in sad, leaving sad, going home, being depressed, doing all this. No, it's the true faith, the faith of the living God. Amen? And it says, fight the good faith for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. I'm just running out of time, so I'm not going to be able to finish it, but I do want to end with one point, so I'm jumping down, so whoever, you know, because I want this point really opened my eyes to something. Because we know we have to do it by faith. But who's going to help us? The Holy Spirit. And it says, you know, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of life and works with righteousness to produce life in us. But if we look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, I've read this scripture many times, but I read it differently. So when you're there, just say amen. Okay. And my version is, I think it might probably be NLT. I seem to like that one lately, but it says, Now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. Number one. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Well, we talk about that, the deposit of the Holy Spirit, you know, we talk about salvation, upon salvation, give us deposit. But this was the part that actually really got my attention. 
It says the spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised. And do you know inheritance is something we enjoy now? It's not something we're going to enjoy. I mean, we are in eternal life, but I'm saying he's talking about the inheritance. He's promised us that now. But in order to access it, we need the Holy Spirit to do it. We need our relationship, and this is what I've come to in the last few weeks. We need to strengthen our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because if we don't, we're going to still walking around committing sin we don't know we're doing. We're going to do and say things that are working against us, not for us. We're going to have a very difficult time entering into this life that God has promised us because he knows all things. And we need him daily. We need him every minute, actually. It's something that I think we have to all long for and acknowledge him as the person, all truth, all knowing, leading us into this life. Amen? Amen. I'm going to round up because Pastor David gives me those beautiful looks. So I have to respect and honor him because, you know. So... I just want to thank everybody tonight. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that every word that we've heard tonight from our Father will go deep into our heart. It will take root and transformation will begin. And I pray, oh God, that every single one of us in here will have a stronger desire for your spirit, Lord, to be closer to you, to want to please you, to want to do your will, Father. It's like not our will, but let thy will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's clap for Jesus for that last part. Uh, let me ask a question from John 14. How many of you, let's read together, let's go together. Okay. The Spirit of God shall have two operations or relationships to level of relationship in you and with you. What does that look like? And what is the difference? Joshua. Can you read it again, Joshua? For the Spirit of God will do what? It will dwell with you. Said the Holy Ghost will dwell with me. But which means the Holy Ghost is here right now, right? And then it shall also be in us. So it's walking in us and walking with us. How do we know the difference? What does that look like? When can you say the Holy Ghost is working with me and the Holy Ghost is working in me? Anybody else can help, Jashon? Jakira, I want to help. What do you do by Holy Ghost? Holy Ghost with you, Holy Ghost in you. There are two levels of relationship. You have a dual relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
at what time could you say the Holy Ghost is walking in me and the Holy Ghost is dwelling in me or dwelling with me? Who wants to help? Yes, in a second. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. For walking in me and dwelling with me. May I know the difference, Lord. Amen. Somebody say Amen. Are you waiting for me? Okay, like, okay. You, you all know it, but let me shed more light. Okay. When you want to do the work of the Father, the work of the ministry, who does it? The Holy Ghost. Do you actually believe today that in Chogi is the Holy Spirit that will be doing his work? If the, if the vessel is yielded, yes. Hmm? If the vessel is yielded, I do. The Holy Spirit is doing the work. Okay. Who has disagree? When the Holy Ghost is working, what do you do? What do you do? No, when the Holy Ghost is working, and the Holy Ghost is working in you, what do you do? You, listen, you do nothing. You do nothing. Say nothing. Yeah. The ministry, the assignment that God has for you and me, there is absolutely nothing that you and I can do. Say nothing. The Holy Ghost will do everything in you. All you do, like Daniel said, is just to follow him. And when he finishes, you give him the, you give him the glory. Do you think in Chogi, the Holy Ghost has been doing everything? No. No. So, now... If you want the Holy Ghost to do everything, what do you do? We don't do nothing. We just sur we surrender it to him. That is why I sent Joshua back to Scarborough. Because every effort, everything done, is like we have done our best. Now let the Holy Ghost do it. Amen. When the Holy Ghost is doing something, all you just have to do is to commit the thing to God's hand. Amen. It's through prayer. This church cannot grow with all effort. I want to do everything we need to know how to do. Yeah? So to allow the Holy Ghost to grow this church, all we do is just pray and hand it over to the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, fill the seat. Holy Ghost, bring souls. Holy Ghost, minister this Sunday. Do your work. Add more to us, as many as should be saved. So all we do is just pray morning and night and watch him do it. And when you see the Lord does it, you give him the praise. Then he does some more. Amen. When the work of the ministry, Jesus Christ said, you can do nothing without me. So when it comes to the work that God has put in your hand, don't try to do it. Just surrender. Just yield. Commit to the Holy Ghost. Say, Holy Spirit, my husband is, needs to be saved. Once you are not... Okay, what are the symptoms that the... You, I mean, Holy Ghost is not doing it, but you are the one doing it. What are the symptoms? Overwork, tired, grumbling, complaining. Frustrating, striving. You are tired. You are complaining. 
and then you get to a point, you get tired, you say, because you are the one doing the work. Zero result or little result or back and forth. You get tired, you get tired, you get tired. You come to church, you are grumbling. How many of you actually come to church and you left grumbling? Yeah? You are doing the work. You get tired. You get frustrated. Because it's not your work. Say it's not our work. It's the work of the Lord. Let the Holy Ghost do it. We'll give him the praise. Amen. So all we have to do is to pray. We come in and pray, Holy Spirit, save your people. Heal the land. Change man. Change him. He knows what to do. He's not weak. I was afraid of sending Joshua back to Scarborough. Oh, devil will catch him. Devil will catch him. Devil will catch him. Devil will catch him. Friend, I'm going to catch him. The Lord said, let him, let him go. I will be in charge. Amen. And now the last two, three days now, he's been doing fine in Scarborough. But he continue to do well in Jesus' name. When it's time, God will bring him here. But don't be afraid of the devil in Scarborough. The Holy Ghost is there with him. You just have to pray for people. That's the sign that you surrender to the Spirit. When you pray and yield to the Holy Ghost, it's called consecration. It's called, called, it's called dedication. It's called surrendering. You surrender, then you pray. Then rest and see the wonders of the Lord. Don't try and change what you cannot change. You cannot prosper yourself with struggling. There's nothing we can do without the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost will perfect the job. Amen. We will see the work of the Holy Ghost and we will be, we will be grateful. The only thing we all aim is to come and shout three hallelujahs every Sunday. Amen. We have done it again, Lord. Amazing. Hallelujah. And that's what I've been saying. Hallelujah. Oh, Pastor David preached. People like, hallelujah. I will do more. The more you give him praise, the more he does more. So, Chogi, let's return back to the spirit. Amen. Now, but it's different from when the Holy Ghost is with you. What goes with you is what you want to do, not the work of the Lord. You have your work. You have the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord you can't do for him. But your work, the Lord will do with you. Okay, like taking care of your baby. Don't say, go take care of my baby. I will not feed my baby. No. You'll be a good mother, but it will be with you. While you are feeding the baby, it will show how to feed the baby. It's your job. It's your work. You want to drive your car? Don't only go drive this car today. I won't. I will just sit down at the chair and only go drive my car. No. There are things that are legitimately yours. Holy Ghost will work with you, give you wisdom, counsel to get it done. You have to know the difference. But any work of the Lord, hands off. All your work do with the Holy Ghost. Amen. The things you have to do. You have to brush your teeth. Don't say, Holy Ghost, brush my teeth for me. It won't work. Take your brush. Say, Holy Ghost, how do I do it? It will now take your hand, use your skill, and do it a better way for you. You can do some job on your own without the Holy Ghost and still succeed. But when the devil attacks it, you, you will lose your success. But your job you do with the Holy Ghost will last forever. Like your home, like driving your car, so people don't know how to walk with the spirit. They think they can walk with the spirit during the ministry. They fail. He doesn't need your counsel. He doesn't need anything from you. All he wants is your praise. Just pray and pray and come in and surrender and watch him do wonder in Jesus' name. Do you understand that? Somebody say bigger amen. So Holy Spirit even the spirit of truth, you are with me and you are in me. Amen. 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 Let's clap for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's thank God for our Father and the Lord. Thank you, Papa, for sharing that.
I, I love that there are some things that he's just he's going to do in you for the sake of the ministry and that's his work and that's and we just praise him and then there are some things where it is your work and now you're including him in so one he includes you in and one you include him in that makes sense he has given you the privilege of being in that work where you're just hands off and you just praise him and you're like wow lord i can't believe i'm part of this and then there are some things where you're saying, you know what I mean? You say, wow, Lord, you, you counted me faithful. That's why I understand, like when you were sharing, I just think of Paul, where it's like, he was like, wow, you counted me faithful in putting me in the ministry. So he put you into something, into his work. And you are just there, you're saying, wow, Lord, you did that, you did that, you did that, you did that, you did that. And then, so we must continue to praise him. And then, but there are some things where we have to bring him into it. Amen. So thank you, Papa, for sharing. Let's thank God again for that. Amen. And praise the Lord. Glad you are here to share with us. Amen. 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 Yeah. As I, I, I'm thinking now, I'm like, okay, Lord, there's some things that I need to ask you about when I, when I get home and include it. And then there are some things as a minister. Sorry, guys, I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to preach. But I was just thinking as you were sharing, Papa, for me, as, as a minister, there are some things I'm like, Lord, thank you that... It, that I'm just here to pray and celebrate you. And the stress, the performance of it is not me. And as a minister, it takes a lot off you, whether, whether you're confronted with something to, you know, to teach, to be here on the altar. It's just about, Lord, you are doing it. You are doing it. Can we rise up to our feet? Are you grateful tonight?